Good morning, everybody. That wasn't too welcoming. <laughs> morning, everybody. Yeah, there, much better. So Microsoft and open source, huh? How many people think of open source when you hear the word Microsoft? Huh? Well, hopefully we're going to change that this morning. So why Microsoft and open source? And actually, Microsoft and open source is a, a journey that we've been on for some time, a journey that was highlighted in the fall. How many people saw this picture or heard of this picture? So a few of you, not all of you. Now, what was really surprising to me about this picture, I was there. Uh, and what really surprised me here is that Satya was not wearing a hoodie. And normally, he always wears hoodies. And uh, so that was really kind of shocking to me. It would have been really cool, though, if he'd ripped off that shirt and showed you this one right here, which is the one I'm wearing. So the fact is, Microsoft's come a long way from the days of Microsoft doesn't like Linux to Microsoft loves Linux with the CEO on stage talking about it. And like I said, this journey has been going on for a long time. You can see that our interactions with open source date back into the early 2000s in various ways. Of course, it's accelerated over time, but there's some surprising landmark events on this. So you can see back in 2005, we open sourced Bill Gates, it turns out. I didn't know that, but I saw this slide. And so I think there's several distros of him running around, one that's curing malaria, another one that's helping Microsoft with their strategy. So it's really paid off for us open sourcing Bill. But I'm going to talk this morning about the different ways that we interact with it. And I'm coming as the CTO of Microsoft's cloud platform, Azure, as Todd introduced me. And Azure's really played, I think, a, a key part in Microsoft's evolution towards embracing open source and leveraging open source and contributing to open source. And, and as part of my role as CTO, I believe that I've contributed in some ways to that. And so that's why I'm here talking to you this morning. So the fundamental question, though, is why Microsoft and open source? And it turns out that there's many answers to that question, because we interact at Microsoft with open source in very many, in, in different ways. And this is common to probably all the companies that you represent or all the ways that you might interact with open source as well. And they span enabling open source, so enabling the use of open source with our technologies, integrating open source into our technologies, releasing our technologies as open source, and then also contributing to open source projects that are being sponsored by somebody else or part of the open community. And I'm going to talk about how we do that for each one of these categories with some examples of the ways we do that. And then I'll also talk about why we do it. So let's talk about enabling first and what that means. And here's an example of all the different open source projects and companies that we enable with our technologies. You can see there's everything from Puppet to SUSE to Oracle. In fact, as I took a look at this wall of logos, I saw that there's penguins, there's geckos, there's whales, there's warthogs, there's even pizza boxes and flasks. So this is really like a Noah's Ark for nerds is the way that I look at this kind of logo wall. So some of the examples of the way that we enable open source technologies with our products. They start with Linux and BSD going back probably close to a decade of su supporting those operating systems with our Hyper-V product, our virtualization platform. But one of the seminal points in Microsoft's journey with open source was actually enabling Linux on Microsoft Azure. So back in 2013, Microsoft Azure started as a, a platform as a service offering, Windows only. But we decided we needed to enable infrastructure as a service so customers could bring their existing applications onto the platform. Our decision at that point wasn't just to support Windows coming out of the box, but we realized that if we really wanted to be a viable cloud platform where customers could come and use the technologies they wanted to use, and turns out that even many predominantly Windows shops have some Linux, that we needed to support Linux as a first class citizen. So the day that we launched the preview offering of infrastructure as a service publicly, we went out at the same time with both Windows and Linux. And that really started this new principle at Microsoft of Linux and open source as a first class citizen in Microsoft's ecosystem. You can see other examples here like PHP, Python, Node.js. We want developers to access my Microsoft Cloud offerings and services using the tools and technologies that they are comfortable with. And many of those are open source technologies like these. So all of these are supported in our web apps technologies. All of them are supported in our client SDKs. And you can see uh, here's a, a new one from yesterday. Support for Golang in our web app service is just the latest offering in this category. Our Hadoop offering is called HD Insight, and that's an example of 
us enabling customers to bring their Hadoop applications onto the platform. And recently, in the last six to nine months, we've uh, introduced support for Spark and Storm as well, since many customers are using Spark and Storm into our HD Insight offering. You can see Puppet and Chef. We worked with both of those companies to make sure that customers could launch virtual machines in Azure that have pre-installed Puppet and Chef agents where they could easily configure them so that those machines could be managed by those solutions. And then a big recent announcement just a few weeks ago at our Azure Con conference with Mesosphere on stage, we announced our Azure Container Service, which is Microsoft's containers as a service offering using Mesos with partnership with Mesosphere and Docker to support Swarm uh, as well as Marathon and Kronos on top of Mesos. So that was a, a big step in us enabling customers, many customers that are using microservices are using those technologies. So why did we do these things? Well, one of them is that we want to make sure, like I said, that guys, customers coming to the platform can use the technologies and tools that they want to use with our technologies. We also want to enable these ecosystems to play on our platforms and bring and enhance our platforms by bringing those ecosystems into our platform. And then we hope that our technologies combined with these technologies will enhance your investments in those existing technologies. So HD Insight, for example, Hadoop as a service. Well, that should enhance your experience because you get managed Hadoop at that point. You can still leverage your Hadoop skills, your Hadoop applications that will take care of running the Hadoop infrastructure for you. And by the way, that was a partnership with Hortonworks that's ongoing. And then it is really just a practical business decision. It's obvious that if we don't support Linux in our cloud platform, that we will be a Windows-only cloud, and that will mean that we're not a really a viable cloud. And so it's just a practical business decision to enable these kinds of technologies for use with our technologies. Now let's talk about integrating now. So what does integrating mean, integrating open source? Well, this is us taking open source technologies and building on top of it. And there's a fantastic example that's just about uh, a few months old with a new uh, uh, announcement that we made just a few weeks ago. It's our Microsoft Azure Data Lake technologies or services, which consists of two services, one we announced in the spring and one we just announced. Our Azure Data Lake store, which we announced in the spring, this is a massive scale store storage system designed for big data analytics. And what we decided to do, instead of create a proprietary interface or a new interface on top of this, we decided that the big data ecosystem really has standardized around HDFS as that interface. And so we went out the door with HDFS as the front end for this data lake service, Web HDFS. Now what data lake allows you to do is create petabyte size files with exabyte size stores designed specifically for big data. And then just a few weeks ago, like I said, at AzureCon, we announced our Azure Data Lake analy uh, analytics service to complement this. And this is where you can come and bring analytical compute jobs to run over that data. And what we decided to do there was to build that on top of Yarn. So internally, that's Yarn. Now, what it exposes is a new interface that we've created for that for big data analytics that is built on top of things that we've learned internally from. And that is a new offering called uSQL, which combines the power of .NET and C Sharp, as well as SQL type uh, semantics over unstructured data. So it's kind of a combination of multiple worlds and really tries to leverage the ecosystem around C Sharp as well. But this is also combined with our HD Insight service. So we've got Hadoop, uSQL, Spark, and Storm all supported on top of this HDFS layer underneath it. But an example of us, instead of inventing our own stuff to create this infrastructure, we decided to take a bet on Yarn. Instead of us inventing our own interface as the data lake interface, we decided to take a bet on HDFS. And there's other examples like this across the platform and across Microsoft offerings. Another one is the Reddish CAS service. So when Azure started and we introduced a cache service, so you could stand up a cache between your web and data tier, we introduced our own caching technology, something we developed in-house. And what it turned out was that many customers were coming and saying, we're taking a standardizing on Redis. And so we de decided to, instead of creating something that looked like Redis, actually just take a bet on Redis. And so we work with Redis, and now our caching as a service is Redis Cache. And you can see some other examples there, Office 365, integration with Moodle, and we've also adopted open standards across our products, including Office and our Edge. 
And then there's a ton of internal projects that we don't talk about that just are bootstrapping internally things where we now have the freedom and liberty to go out and say, let's go start with something that's open source. Now, the reasons that we do these kinds of things while we integrate open source, well, one is consistency with our other offerings. So you can see in the case of HDFS, well, what that does is just makes that Azure Data Lake service consistent with the other offerings we've got around big data that are standardized on HDFS. We also collaborate with the broader community in many of these cases, and that's really something we find valuable. It's like when we're working with Redis, collaborating with them, and there's other examples that of, of us taking advantage of technologies, and we start to engage with those communities, and you'll see that we interact with those communities in other different ways as well as a result. But fundamentally, one of the obvious reasons that we do this is just agility and time to market. Instead of going and having to create everything our own just because we've got some principle of no open source, we need to do it ourselves, we get a lot of benefit out of saying, hey, if there's something that's open source and that will get us to market faster and enable ecosystems and help customers, then let's go and approach it that way. And so that's been really liberating for us. Now the next way that we interact with open source is releasing stuff to open source. So let me give you some examples here. And this is the one, one of the biggest releases of technologies into open source that we've got. Something that was really considered secret sauce by Microsoft for a long, long time. And this is the .NET platform. So if you take a look at the .NET platform, and specifically the .NET core aspect, you can see that the .NET platform consists of multiple layers. You see this common layer underneath, and then you see .NET Core on the right, and you see the .NET Framework on the left. And on, on top of that, you see ASP.NET 5, which is the web interface the, for building web apps on top of the .NET Frameworks and, dot, and Core .NET. Now, these technologies, what we decided to do was take them cross-platform. So they've traditionally been only Windows, and if you wanted to leverage .NET technologies and C-sharp on other platforms, you had to go to third parties, like use Mono, which is supported by Xamarin. What we decided to do is make these first-class support right from the core technologies, and so we've ported these things to Linux and OS X, and now they're available in their native form on those technologies. We've also done a lot of work to integrate Visual Studio support for debugging and deploying to Docker into Linux. So one of the demos that I did at DockerCon, for example, was deploying an ASP.NET 5 app into a Docker container running on Linux. And so that is an example of you being able to use Microsoft technologies on traditionally non-Microsoft platforms. But we've open sourced all of this stack from the bottom to the top. ASP.NET 5 or the ASP.NET libraries or were open sourced a while back. Some of the .NET libraries were open sourced a while back, but you can see that we've, we've open sourced the core CLR, what we considered secret sauce of the .NET platform, we've open sourced that, as well as the .NET core there in the middle. All of that is open source. And there's many, many other examples of us open sourcing our own technologies. TypeScript, if you're familiar with TypeScript, which is uh, uh, type safe JavaScript, that is a, a technology produced by Microsoft, helps Java develop, JavaScript developers create code that is more manageable and easy to debug. We're using TypeScript for all our TypeScript projects internally. Office 365 uses TypeScript heavily, and we've contributed all of that to open source. Python tools for Visual Studio. So many, many developers out there are using Python. In fact, the Python tools for Visual Studio add-in is the number one add-in for Visual Studio. It's actually surpassed some of the C-sharp technologies and .NET technologies that developers use for Visual Studio. Our Power BI, which is a visualization library for our big data analytics, that has been open sourced. You can see AutoRest and Azure, all our SDKs for all of Azure. Our principle is SDKs, we open source them. So they're all up in GitHub. Linux integration services for Linux, for Hyper-V, they're all open sourced. We've got templates that allow you to create applications in Azure. All of that we do as open source. And then Microsoft Research is, has a tradition of releasing projects, their projects that they work on, into open source. So why are we releasing all this stuff into open source? So one of them is that we build, we hope to build communities around these technologies by making them open and getting contributions and getting people excited about these technologies and being able to touch and feel them and contribute to them. Another one is that for the SDK specifically, if they're open source, then developers when they've run into problems, can more easily debug their problems just by going in and looking at the source and understanding exactly 
how it works. We can never have documentation that's as good as the source code itself for many developers. And so that's one of the values of having those SDKs being open sourced or having bugs in the SDKs be fixed through contributions by people from the outside. We also are supporting uh, an ecosystem internally. So if you take a look at one of the things that we've done by porting .NET to Linux, for example, is that internally at Microsoft, we've got more and more projects that are based on Linux. And we didn't want to be in a position where, we, where we'd force our own developers that are proficient in C-sharp and .NET technologies to have to switch to something else if they wanted to develop for Linux. And so by making that cross-platform and open sourcing it as necessary, we get this ecosystem internally of support for .NET on Linux, and that means that we can have common tooling, consistent experiences, and leverage those tools and techniques ourselves internally across those platforms. And then finally, let me talk a little bit about contribution to open source. So we have now, for the past few years, had a very aggressive culture of encouraging developers to contribute to open source projects. This is a list of some of the open source projects that we contribute to, that many Microsoft developers contribute to. If you take a look at the Linux kernel, Microsoft traditionally been one of the top contributors to the Linux kernel. Of course, in the context of those Hyper-V integration services and support for Hyper-V. But another one is Docker. We've had a really great collaboration with Docker that goes back about a year and a half. I mentioned that I gave a keynote at DockerCon showing Visual Studio integration with Docker and deploying Docker containers to Linux. But one of the cool things that we've done with Docker is that we decided to build container technology into Windows Server, similar to the container technology in Linux. And instead of creating our own APIs for that, which you might have been expected of the old Microsoft, we decided, hey, there's an ecosystem and a standard, basically, for Docker API, for container APIs. And that's really being managed and shepherded by Docker. So we work with Docker to make sure that you can leverage the Docker tool chain and APIs to manage Windows containers through collaboration with them. And as part of that, we actually, one of our developers that works on the, the Windows Server team working on Docker technologies is the number one committer to the Docker GitHub repo from January to August, and might still be, I haven't checked recently, from, Docker, uh, from January to Linux, uh, August, the number one contributor to the Docker GitHub repo, both in check-ins and commits. Take a look at Hadoop and Yarn. So that bet on Yarn that I talked about earlier with HD Insight and Azure Data Lake, that's not just a one-way interaction. We are in the, we've made a, a ton of contributions to Yarn to make it better, to add resource constraints and scheduling and load balancing and better support for fine grain optimizations. All of that has gone directly back into the Yarn open source community. The Python Software Foundation, here's an example of where we not just contribute code, but we contribute money. So we we're, we're hope it uh, uh, had a conference at, on campus, uh, PyCon, which is uh, uh, scientific programming on Python. We funded that conference. It was the largest of its kind ever. So, and we also contribute money to these organizations, like the Linux Foundation, which I mentioned. So it's not just people contributing, but Microsoft actually putting our money behind these things to help them. Redis Cache, I mentioned that one. OpenSSH, here's another example. We wanted to make sure that OpenSSH works great on Windows. So many people that are coming from a Linux world, they're using OpenSSH. And OpenSSH is a fantastic te technology for headless management. So instead of forcing everybody to learn PowerShell remoting, which is the Microsoft first party remoting, we said, let's let them bring their OpenSSH open skills. And instead of us building our own OpenSSH library and tooling for Windows, let's go contribute to the open one. And so that's what we've done. And just yesterday, we announced that the first we've, uh, the work we've done, been doing on that, is now up in GitHub in the open. So you can go contribute it and play with it and look at it as well. And we hope to have that production ready in the next few months. Mesos, I mentioned our co uh, collaboration with Mesosphere, another great, fantastic partnership. We've been working with Mesos on, on porting Mesos to Windows and making Mesos support Windows containers as well. All of that done in the open with Mesos and Mesosphere. And there's much, much more. So why do we do these things? Why are we contributing? Well, for one, there's an obvious one. We want to make sure that these technologies, you get a first-class experience on top of Azure and on top of Microsoft platforms like Hyper-V. So it's, of course, in our best interest to go and contribute code that's going to make that great with Microsoft technologies. 
But another one is that we do want to extend the community and the addressable reach of these communities. That OpenSSH example, we want to make sure that those communities that are using OpenSSH don't have an unpleasant experience or just don't opt out because they don't, can't do things the way that they're used to doing or wanting to do it when it comes to interacting with Microsoft technologies. And we also want to establish credibility. This is a case where we know in the open source world, you can't just take, take, take. You need to give and take. It's about a community, and that's why we're all here. And so we recognize that if we just took these technologies, built our stuff on it, and didn't give it back, that we wouldn't be really participating in the community, and the community wouldn't participate with us. And so it is a very strong principle of ours to participate in this in the way that the open source community expects, which means let's all work together on this out in the open. And then we want to ex enhance our joint customer experiences. So this isn't just a one-way street. It's not just that, hey, Mesos support for Windows is uh, enabling Microsoft. It also helps Mesos. Docker on Windows helps Docker and their customers as well. One of the things that Docker has told us, for example, is that many of their customers have been asking, when are you going to have support for Windows? And that's because many of them are mixed shops. There's still a lot of Windows out there and lots of Linux and Windows mixed shops. And so they want to use the same tooling for both. And so Docker, working with Microsoft, helps both of our customers jointly. And doing it out in the open, of course, is a great way to collaborate on that. We also participate in open standards bodies. And this is another place where we contribute and support open source efforts. I've just got a few of them listed up here. So the Linux Foundation, it's kind of hard to read there. It's at the middle and the bottom. The Core Infrastructure Foundation, the Open Container Initiative, and Open Compute Project. And so those of you not familiar with some of these, the Open Infrastructure Foundation, that is our work with other, a m number of other companies to fund development that will help the security of open source products. So one of them is OpenSSL, where we've got funding to support code reviews of OpenSSL to make sure that it's secure for everybody, and Microsoft's participating in that. The Open Compute Project, that's an example of us contributing to open standards. Of course, Open Compute Project, we're partners in there with Facebook and other companies, of contributing our, our cloud platform server designs. So this is something where contributing those designs can help enterprises build their own servers to take advantage of the learnings that we've got in our hyperscale cloud. But there's also other reasons that we participate in that. One is that by making these open standards, now we can get the OEM ecosystem out there to see these server designs and build them, which will bring down costs for anybody wanting to take advantage of these kinds of designs. And the Open Container Initiative, again, this is strong work with Docker and other companies to say, let's, not, let's try to avoid bifurcation of open con of containers and the container APIs. Let's standardize on this and let's work all together as a community to drive the technologies forward so that everybody can take advantage of it. So finally, this really, the why of Microsoft really is about giving customers choice with our technologies, not forcing them to have to take a Microsoft stack from bottom to top, but be able to use the technologies they bring from the open community and other places on Microsoft technologies and to take advantage of our technologies where you want to. Really a mix and match. You get to decide. It's, of course, agility and time to market, as you saw some examples. Just makes business sense for us to be open-minded about taking advantage of open source technologies where we can get time to market. And then building a strong ecosystem and building, and building a, a sense of community around our technologies and open source technologies where Microsoft's a participant at the table just like everybody else. So I encourage you guys to connect with open source at Microsoft. There's many, many open source specific job op openings at Microsoft. You can see there's 498 jobs listed. I just did this query a couple days ago. 498 jobs that we've got open with the word Linux in it. We are hungry for people that are experts in open source technologies, including Linux. You can see there's 330 jobs that are outside the United States. And there's many, many more inside the United States. So even if you're from outside, there's a job for you at Microsoft. And then you can see there's a ton of GitHub repos. This is one of the things that we've standardized on is all our open work is done in GitHub. So you can go there and you can find Azure, Office, Visual Studio, and Microsoft as a whole, two, over 240 repositories up there in GitHub. So I'd like to encourage all of you to pass your resumes to the center aisle. And I can just pick them up on my way out here. But I just want to conclude by saying that 
Microsoft loves open source. It's fantastic to be at a conference like this, be invited up here to participate in the community with you guys. And we hope to make this, uh, we, I have to say, we've been working at this for a while. We're still learning. And I think that with uh, your help, we'll learn and be great communities, uh, great members of this community. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I guess um, I don't have the slidey thingy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm truly excited to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Isabel Jimenez. I'm a distributed systems engineer at Mesosphere. I was asked today to uh, tell the story about uh, how I got a job from contributing to FOSS. So I work on Mesos, and I like to contribute to open source in general. So let me start by outlining the steps to that path and give you my takeaways on the industry in general. <laughs> I grew up in France, Paris, and as most of us, I uh, started legitimately being curious about computers in high school. I installed my first Linux distribution on my home computer. It was a Mandriva, in case you needed more proof of my Frenchness. <laughs> uh, and I, um, I began writing small shell scripts. Between man pages and other people's code, I started um, discovering software, discovering computers. So I had this cool idea. My goal was to uh, write a script that would quantify my time online and set up alerts, kind of achievements on time gaps. And well, what happened is that I output time. And I don't know if you've noticed how your clock desktop works. It's dynamic and shows real time. Well, mine didn't. It was very bad. Uh, when we start working on our goals and contributing and learning from other people's code, we have to keep in mind that, of course, it takes multiple tries and a lot of reading open code. I <laughs> wanted to share this uh, picture of one of my colleagues today. I'm not sure how he's going to react. <laughs> Uh, he has a, this is ridiculous, <laughs> face. Uh, it was one of the, f it was the face almost everyone had when I manifested my interest uh, in computer science. So family, teachers, everyone. We also have to know that we shouldn't be stopped by social uh, obstructions. I had discovered free open source software. FOSS gave me the determination and also the opportunity to follow my passion and goals. This discovery led me to know about uh, the college I recently graduated from, Epitech. At the time I heard about Epitech, it was the biggest IT infrastructure in Europe running on NetBSD all wired up with AFS, a distributed file system. So the funny story is that one of the AFS guys came to our school and was really surprised that such a big cluster actually worked. <laughs> for something that wasn't initially designed for, it shows how impactful FOSS is. In such an immersive open source culture and environment, I learned how to code and also got the most respect for different contributors of all kinds. But when we were in college, we also had this common worry about how to get experience. We also wor we worried about how we're going to get a job without experience. And most of us think that we cannot get that from open source. Well, a year before I graduated, I moved to the US. 
and started looking forward my graduation and how I, got a, how I can get a job. I learned that what companies really want to see is your code. And how better than to contribute it and share it in large, communal, complicated code bases. Contributing to open source is kind of intimidating. You have to be sure you're not breaking that teenager writing script's mind. That alone sets the bar pretty high. So I knew about Docker. It's a great project. It has a great community. And I felt safe enough to, be, to start doing my first contribution. What happens when you start contributing to open source is excitement and a bit of addiction. So you start getting interested in contributing to other open source projects. So I found out about Apache Mesos through OPW, today's outreach program, internship at Twitter. One of the things I forget to mention a lot when praising open source is how you get better. The bar of quality of the code in open source is very high. And when I started contributing to Mesos, review after review, I get to learn a lot from my mistakes to be a better engineer. The Mesos community is one of the most welcoming. Committers are very, very enthusiastic to hear about newcomers willing to contribute. They're there for you to welcome you and answer any of your questions. Mesos, it's an Apache project. And being that, it has to be run the Apache way, which means that it has to involve different people from different backgrounds and different environments, different companies. So Microsoft, Apple, Airbnb, Twitter, to say just a few, all contribute to Mesos together. So everything started for me as a fun way to just feel my personal projects field in my resume. But after my internship, I graduated, and I was still looking for a job. And I decided that I wasn't ready to give up working in such a stimulating environment, working on cutting edge technology. I decided that being a contributor and being part of a community does not go away as easily. So I applied to a job at my uh, internship mentor's company, Benjamin Heinemann, and he brought me into Mesosphere. Mesosphere is one of the hippest company of the Silicon Valley today. We work on what I believe will change and deeply impact the industry. So. I want to very emphasize how fortunate I feel about being part of a company with such a strong open source culture. My full-time work is working on open source. The company is so committed to open source that all his product components are also fully open source. Our product is DCOS. So the company is so absorbed by the open source culture that they couldn't not launch DCOS in a community version. For, you that, for those of you that doesn't know, don't know, sorry, uh, what a DCOS is, it's the data center operating system. So building distributed systems is hard. Our mission is to make building and running those systems as easy as building and running an app on your phone. Michael Hosenblas, I believe, will give more details about DCS if you're interested this afternoon. So my path 
it's one that anyone can follow. But of course I wouldn't be here without programs like Google Summer of Code or Outreachy. Google Summer of Code equivalents, but for people from underrepresented communities. And uh, just so you know, Outreach's deadline for applications, it's on November 2nd, so hurry up. <laughs> to conclude, I'll say that all of us here will agree that open source is the successful future for the tech industry. Open source not only attracts talent, but enforces it. It's a way to show and improve your skills. There's no better way to get experience than to contribute to open source. So if you'd like to talk more about it, please come find me or reach out on Twitter. Thank you. All righty. Ooh, that's loud. How's everyone doing? All right. So I just want to say a big thank you to Todd and the rest of the All Things Open team for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, this is my first time at All Things Open, and this is just an absolutely tremendous event. So please, everyone, put your hands together for, for the whole team. So this, my, my presentation actually really neatly fits on from Isabel's excellent talk just now. Um, this is very simple. I just, I'm really here to talk about an opportunity that every one of you in this room, I think, can play a role in for building a, a brighter future. Um, but to talk about this opportunity, we need to go back in time a little bit. When I was 18 years old, I unfortunately looked like this. Believe it or not, hair did exist on my head at one point in my life. Um, and back in those days, it, when I was 18, my brother introduced me to Linux and open source. And the tool of choice that I used was one of these. Um, not this specific thing, this is running DOS. This is a picture from the internet. Um, but many of us started out like this. And this was a computer connected to an internet connection that had Linux and open source running on it. And I remember vividly the sense of opportunity and excitement that this opened up to me. As an 18-year-old living in central England, I was suddenly connected into this world of opportunity and ele electronic collaboration. And this was profoundly exciting. Um, What's interesting is in the last five to 10 years, we've seen a tremendous growth in technology. Um, the graph on the left-hand side here is the exponential growth curve of, of computing. And if we follow this forward, in 2025, a $1,000 computer will, will be as powerful as a human brain. If we follow that up to 2050, that $1,000 computer will be as powerful as every human brain on the planet. And this opens up tremendous opportunities for artificial intelligence, for big data, uh, for containerization, virtualization, and everything else. But horsepower isn't the only thing that we need to care about. Connectivity is important. The graph on the right-hand side uh, shows internet adoption across the world as well. And it's not just people in the United States and other Western countries getting faster and faster internet. It's people in parts of the world that have never had access to the internet getting connected as well. But people are not getting connected on those big bulky computers or on laptops. <coughs> They're invariably getting connected with their smartphones. And this shows the hockey stick that's happening in terms of smartphone adoption. Again, people in parts of the world getting connected that never got connected uh, beforehand. And what, what excites me is that sense of excitement and opportunity when I was 18 years old that existed with this um, is happening in a more modern era and opening up opportunity for people around the world. And if we look at the tools and, and technologies that are available today, I think you primarily see six things. Um, the first thing is cheap computing, Arduino, Raspberry Pis. Many of us are familiar with these. We, we tend to use them. Um, uh, we, we can create simple or more complicated um, devices. We're seeing 3D printing, people building uh, cases and, and tooling and fixtures uh, for en encompassing that, that computing. We're seeing things like drones. The, this is the 3D robotic solo drone, completely Linux powered, open SDK, um, just a tremendous piece of technology. But we're also seeing, of course, open source, this massive library of, of, of tools and, and, and other facilities for writing programming languages or building web apps or whatever it might be that can be used in that technology. So if you take a Raspberry Pi and you put it in a 3D printed case and you run Linux on it and you run open source on it, 
you're not just limited by the horsepower in that box as well. You've, of course, you've got the cloud out there, which is wonderful for, for further processing or for, for data and various other things. But the thing that was always missing was technology people have always built things together. Um, but there's that chasm between building something and connecting it to consumers who want to get access to it. And typically, there was distribution channels that stood in the way. And of course, crowdfunding is breaking all of that down for us. What excites me about this is that hundreds of millions of people around the world are getting connected to the global conversation. New minds that never had access to technology before are now getting access to technology and bring in entrepreneurialism, insight, and ideas, and creativity to the fold. And for me, that's just remarkably exciting. So what's interesting is if this works. It was interesting is if you take this data, it opens up interesting avenues of, of, of thought. Because as human beings, we're pretty linear creatures. Um, and we can thank hundreds of thousands of years of evolution for this, that we tend to think very linearly in terms of our immediate surroundings. And that's because a million years ago, we weren't necessarily worried about building computers. We were worried that that tiger in that bush over there is going to eat us. So we don't tend to think many chess moves ahead. But if we know that technology's got this exponential gro growth curve, we, we can see the growth in internet access. We can see the kind of devices that people are using. We can see the kind of technology that's available. We can say, instead of planning for technology today and the problems that we have today, let's think about where we're going to be in five years and what technology is available there and plan for that. And what this does <coughs> is it means that we can have truly bold and audacious goals. <coughs> the reason why open source has been so magical in my mind is that we can take on anything, absolutely anything. <coughs> I mean, watching the Microsoft presentation was just absolutely wonderful to me. To see Microsoft as a company that was traditionally, in the early days, a competitor embracing this. And as was made quite clear, this is not about uh, a, a sneaker move. This is about being part of a community, being part of an ecosystem. So we can really take anything on. This is where the opportunity lies, is that when you look at all of these things, where the action is happening is with openness. And I'm not just talking about openness of source code. I'm talking about open hardware, open collaboration. And the notion that anybody with ideas, creativity, and insight can play a role in, in making incredible things happen. This is the challenge in my mind, is that how do we effectively equip people to collaborate using these tools? You know, Back when I had that computer, it was a much narrower way in which we collaborate together. The world is a lot more complicated now. And this is not just about getting a, a couple of people in a room collaborating. This is about distributed collaboration. How can everybody play a role in, in working together as effectively as, as possible? And this is something that I've dedicated my career to trying to understand, um, as of many of you as well. And I think where we're lucky is that open source is where society innovates. This has been my view for a number of years. If you look at how we figure out, figured out how to build code, how we figured out how to govern open communities, how we get that interesting balance right between commercial stakeholders and open source communities, we did that in open source. Uh, we figured out a lot of these messages and open these lessons in open source. But Many of you will have seen the, that whole adoption graph for, uh, for technology. We're still on the left side of that graph in my mind. The wider world, I don't think, has really got to this yet. So we're in the, labro the laboratory of, uh, of, um, of, of, of how we figure this kind of uh, collaboration and innovation out. And we can see, of course, many examples of this. Wikipedia. How many people here use Wikipedia? That's what I thought. Lots of people. Valued at tens of billions of dollars by the Smithsonian. Thousands of contributors. <clears throat> it's a tremendous site. And it was somebody who had that bold and audacious goal of, why don't we go out there and document uh, humanity? <clears throat> and this has provided a, a tremendous resource for kids and people to learn about technology and learn about the world and various other things. Red Hat, a wonderful success story in open source, taking taking the, the, the principles of open source and collaboration and building a very successful business around that. Linux is powering devices, stock markets, infrastructure. We've seen OpenStack that provided the ability for us to diversify in the cloud. Instead of having one homogenous cloud, now we can have multiple clouds and people compete and build interesting technology there. And then, of course, GitHub has effectively become the place where we, we build a lot of this code, where we collaborate around these different pieces. You know, one of the things that... Uh, that Brandon Keeper said yesterday is that source code is the artifact. 
the real value there is 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 the collaboration it's the it's the engagement that we have with each other but this is in my mind the first generation because as we think about how we equip that next generation of collaborators it's not just about software anymore it used to be about software then it became software and services and now we've seen hardware playing a role here as well so i mentioned this the 3d robotics solo drone open hardware in in in, in parts open source a variety of different services that fit into that how do we work together in a distributed manner to to build something like the the the, the solo the other device down here that kind of looks like that robot from short circuit um is is the mycroft this is a recently kickstarter funded um artificial intelligence box it's kind of like an open source version of the amazon echo completely open hardware completely open source completely open services and i the fact that we can have successful crowdfunding projects such as that keeps me awake at night with excitement. I think this is just absolutely awesome. But we can do better. We can do much better. And this may seem a bit weird because as I know many of you in the audience and um, you've had to sit through me rambling on about community for the last 14 years. But I think we're scratching the surface of the potential. I think we are fundamentally inefficient human beings when it comes to how we collaborate around building these different things. And I think there's so many areas in which we can, we can improve and refine how we do these different, uh, how we work in these different projects. And I've been talking about for, for a while now that I believe a renaissance is happening in community leadership as well as collaboration. And the renaissance was this interesting time many years ago that really effectively connected the, the Middle Ages with the modern era. It, it was when we went from observation um, to documentation and building repeatable best practice. And this happened in the early days of open source. When I started out in 1998, I just kind of watched projects and how they did it and tried to apply those principles to, to the things that I was doing. Um, and of course, not everything applies to all projects in the same kind of way. So we're seeing this interesting renaissance <coughs> and everybody in here has got a piece that they can play into that. <coughs> and each piece, I think, is figuring out that collaborative workflow. How do we have ideas? A great idea can come from anywhere. It can, from, can come from anyone. How do we have conversations around those great ideas? How do we sit together and plan out how we actually implement those things? How do we actually build the technology? What, what tools, processes, and, uh, and approaches do we take there? How do we assure quality? You know, how does uh, QA and continuous integration and various other pieces fit in? How do we ship products that don't just feel like a collection of parts lumped together, but actually feels like a consistent a product that delivers something that people really want. How do we build powerful, diverse, and engaged volunteer communities where everybody can play a role um, and make things better? And how do we lead and govern? And uh, like I say, every one of you in this room has an answer to some of these questions. And we've figured out some of these things, but not all of them. So I believe that there's five primary challenges that we face um, moving forward as we figure out this, this collaboration. <coughs> The first thing is in tooling. We have to have um, not just, I think, open tools, but tools that really map to the reality of how we build technology. Um, I've been getting interested, uh, Jim Whitehurst was talking yesterday about behavioral economics, which is uh, fascinating to me, and I'm giving a lightning talk later on about it. But um, economists are irritating individuals because they have this unrealistic way of how people actually think. And I think when we start building tooling and process for how people really think and how people really operate, it means that we can be more effective in the reality of how we build how we build products and services. The other element here is uh, reputation. We have a problem in open source where somebody can join a project, they do really great work for a year, um, then they don't really do anything, but the reputation doesn't really decay. So what happens is people maintain reputations and they have an influential um, impact on a project, even if they're not really doing anything. And in a meritocracy, that makes it difficult for new people who are trying to make, make their own impact on the project to actually succeed. So how do we manage reputation so the people doing the good work are still active? Of course, diversity is something that's, that's the, that is often talked about at conferences, online, and this is tremendously important. We have to stop tolerating an environment where only a small proportion of people can be successful. To me, this is not about just provide an environment in which people can engage. This is about optimizing people for success, and it shouldn't matter what gender you are, what race you are, but also what thought processes and appro approaches and, 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 and perspectives you bring to the mix as well. And then finally, 
Um, I think sustainability is an important piece. There are, sadly, thousands of open source projects out there that are unmaintained, and some people will refer to them as being dead. I am a what I'd like to consider a rational optimist, um, and in the same way that I believe that anyone who goes on online dating sites, there is somebody out there for all of you. I believe every open source project has somebody who cares for it. And I think we can come up with interesting ideas for how we can connect the right people to maintain those projects. Because if we just accept that they're dead, then effectively we just lose all of that incredible work. So in closing, um, a couple of final thoughts here. I, I'm, I've, I'm devoting my life to figuring this stuff out. And I think if we can figure out how we build effective collaboration, it means that we all become more efficient. And this is one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be joining GitHub next month as uh, Director of Community uh, and trying to figure out some of these, some of these challenges uh, in conjunction with all of you and having an open dialogue. But the final thought I'd like to share is, when I was 18 years old and I had that horrible beard and I connected through that computer, the opportunity that I felt, and every one of you in this room will have had a similar experience of how you felt empowered by open source. If we can figure out these challenges, just think about what this means for the next generation, such as my three-year-old little boy, Jack. And it just excites me about the world that he's about to inherit that we're going to all help create. Thank you. Ah. Yeah, so I'm sometimes known as the OpenStack guy, often known now as the Cloud Foundry guy. Uh, I'm not doing either of those things today. I'm also, apparently, I have no slides, which is okay. Um, they'll catch up at some point, maybe. Maybe not. I can do it without the slides. Okay, there we go. So I worked at NASA for a couple of years. And I went there because I really believed in this dream of uh, the government as an ally. And I think NASA, in particular, is this place where many of us as children dreamed of going to work. Uh, and it was probably the worst experience of my life just to realize that it was also a bureaucracy. Um, and so one of the things I, I started working on when I was there was this idea of how do we produce an antidote to bureaucracy. Um, and I think of, of red tape. This is actually one of the original kinds of red tape. People don't realize when they say red tape, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about a kind of string that was used to tie around documents when they were important to differentiate them from documents that were not important, which had regular twine. And trying to cut red tape doesn't actually help. What happens is uh, you produce more red tape. Bureaucracy expands to fulfill the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. That was Oscar Wilde. Um, so I want to talk about an antidote, which is not the opposite. This is not about getting rid of bureaucracy. This is about um, automating it. It has to exist. And these documents have to exist. They have things like uh, you know, property titles in them and stuff. In, in IT systems, these are typically what we think of as security documents. And for those of you who've worked in government, you can't run a piece of software for a government agency without what's called a security plan, an SSP. Um, they're basically a book. So every time you write a piece of software, you also have to write a book. Um, most of you, I think, have not written books. I've never written a book. Actually, the last time I agreed to write a book, um, I got shingles. <laughs> I've had to lie down for six weeks. So um, the idea of writing a book actually terrifies me. At NASA, I paid somebody else to write the book for our, for our software. Um, and this is kind of the experience that people have. Uh, increasingly, we see government agencies trying to do Agile. They're like, hey, we're really excited. Uh, every two weeks, we have a new version of our software that sits on the shelf for nine months until we write a new version of the book so that we're allowed to push it into production, which is really, really depressing, which is why almost nobody stays and works for the government for very long. Um, I know there's a bunch of folks from 18F here, uh, and I, um, I have a ton of respect for them, um, primarily because they're still trying to do something that I gave up trying to do many years ago. But now they've, 
made me feel so embarrassed about giving up that I've come back to, to sort of try again. Um, and I, I titled this as reported by Joshua McKenty just because I want to point out I am reporting something that I see happening that I've been involved in, uh, but by no means is my project. Uh, and it's also pretty early. I remember uh, when we first launched OpenStack, it was 6,000 lines of code. And people were like, we don't get it. Why is this interesting? Why is this important? And now people are like, oh yeah, OpenStack, we've heard of that. Uh, we don't have to have that conversation anymore. So I like to talk about things when it's a few hundred to a few thousand lines of code um, and nobody really understands why it's important yet. All right, the, a little bit of history. This is not a brand new idea. Folks have had the idea of automating compliance or automating certification for a long time. Uh, Donald Knuth is uh, sort of, and which I'm probably mispronouncing, and everyone's going to laugh at me. Uh, uh, literate programming, the idea that your code was also a book, right? Kind of a cool idea. Um, for some reason, every time I bring this up these days, people hate me, uh, and I think it's something to do with the joke about the heap. Uh, there was a, there's a thread on Twitter. I tried to suggest that this was a good metaphor, but I still think it's a good metaphor. Um, Chris Hoff organized and ran a thing called A6 originally, and then it was turned into something called Cloud Audit. Uh, I did an implementation of Cloud Audit uh, at Piston, trying to get that working in the OpenStack community early on, and it was too early, and people were like, we don't get it. Why does this make any sense? Um, this idea of, uh, I don't know, anytime you have tests that go along with your code, that's part of your code that says, this is how the code should work and what it should do, this is on this path towards, why do we have to write a book to go along with the code? We just haven't quite got there yet. So. I uh, like YAML, and um, there are cool things happening with YAML these days. One of them is Gitbook. How many of you have heard of Gitbook? A couple of you. Okay, you're going to learn something. Everyone's going to learn something. Gitbook is really cool. So in between uh, myself and primarily uh, Diego over at 18F, um, we started playing around with what a YAML format for controls would look like. A control is basically the piece of documentation that says our system runs in this way and therefore it's secure, it meets this requirement. So if, you, if your passwords need to be longer than eight characters, that's a control. If, uh, if you need to prove that any event that happens in your software that, that changes system state is logged for audit, that's a control. How do you prove this? So we started playing around with this format um, and now there's a bunch of other people at 18F that have been working on documenting all of the controls for cloud.gov using this, this sort of drafty, I don't even think we would call it a standard, I think we just call it YAML. Um, and so you start with, okay, we got some YAML, now what? Well, we need a pipeline, right? I'm a CI, CD guy. I believe that the center of every great system these days is your continuous integration pipeline. So. Uh, at Pivotal, we accidentally started a pretty cool CI project called Concourse. How many of you have heard of Concourse? Okay, second cool thing you're learning today. Concourse is amazing. Um, if you like dependency injection, which many hipster programmers do these days, the idea of, hey, I just I say what my system needs rather than doing really perverse things to get it started, think of Concourse as like the first CI system to have dependency injection. So rather than saying, run this job after this job, run this job after this job, get really confused and crash, um, you just say, oh, this job doesn't work unless these other things happen first. And then Concourse figures it out. So you can describe a pipeline of docs. And you say, oh, I've got some YAML that comes from, say, Cloud Foundry that says the kind of controls provided by Cloud Foundry. I've got some YAML that comes from the GSA that says, these are the controls required under this particular standard. I write my own little YAML file that says, this is how I'm running this system, and it pulls in those other two YAMLs, and we have a pipeline that merges a bunch of those together. So you're just smashing YAML up. Um, and then this last step is, is Gitbook. Gitbook, um, when it started, consumed you know, Markdown and uh, I think ASCII doc, which feel pretty close to YAML, and it turns out you know, cramming YAML into Gitbook is not as weird as it sounds. 
So all of a sudden, you've got a bunch of different YAML, merge it together, you put it into a formatter, and out of that you get a PDF or a Word doc or a Mobi or EPUB that you can read on your phone. And you can give that to the auditor and say, here's my book, it's 150 pages. You also get an OpenSCAP file or a CIS benchmark audit file. So you can dump that into Nessus and say, scan my system. This is exactly how it should work. If it doesn't work, that's a failing test. And if those of you have ever actually lived in government, government lives by waivers. There's no such thing as compliance. Nobody in the history of government has ever achieved compliance with their own rules. It's not possible. So <laughs> the goal of this is to know how far out of compliance you are. How much risk are you embracing? And somebody is going to sign off and say, OK, that's an acceptable amount of risk. What they want is a list. So you generate a list that says, these are the risks we're accepting. These are the controls that we know the standard says we're supposed to have, and we know that our system doesn't support. That's a, that's a waiver list. You generate that too. Now the nice thing about having all of this in CI is when our, our esteemed colleagues at NIST come out with a new format for this, this standards thing called 800-53, or uh, FedRAMP, for instance, or, or HIPAA, or PCI compliance, when the new standard comes out, they're going to update their Git repo. Concourse is going to notice. It's going to say, oh, OK, uh, let's rebuild the docs and see which waivers we need now. It's a versioned artifact. Do you want to go share that with the auditor? The PDF is in an S3 bucket. So all of a sudden, your audit and compliance feels like programming, instead of feeling like this evil parallel activity that, that makes kids cry when they think about the fact that NASA runs that way too. Um, Spruce, I stuck that in the middle. That's uh, this very new project. It's literally, I think, last week. It's a YAML merging tool. <laughs> so I said I was sort of talking about magically smushing YAML together. You actually need something that does that. Spruce does a really good job. All right, I mentioned that I'm reporting on this. I, uh, I didn't really invent it. I happened to like, get really angry about having to write a book at one point. Um, so Diego, I mentioned before, he's been doing a lot of the heavy lifting over at 18F, as has the rest of the team there. Uh, Chris Hoff, I think you got to sort of give him props for trying to do this way too early. And Cloud Audit is still a CSA project. It's still moving forward. It kind of solves a different problem, but it's very necessarily in parallel. And Alex is the, uh, the inventor and lead of Concourse. Um, oh, and then the Stark and Wayne guys put together Spruce. So there is now enough of these tools. And this is, this is not a, hey, here's this final project, right? But this is what's happening in a really interesting community that could probably use some help. Because if it's just like me and Alex plus the 18F folks, like, we're going to get a lot done. It's terrifying how much is, is being done right now. So just to put this in context, cloud.gov, if you haven't heard about it yet, is Cloud Foundry running on Amazon for government agencies run and managed by the 18F. It's insanely cool. And they're using roughly this process, not yet using Concourse and Spruce. They're using Python scripts and some, some let's say, rough prototypes. But they're using that to produce their certifications. So we've been trying to do this for a long time. And I think maybe our ideas were too early. The tools weren't quite mature enough. Uh, the auditors weren't ready to say, oh, wait, you, oh, you auto-generated your security plan? How is that a good idea? But actually, we all know that things that we do by hand are never as reliable as things that we do with a tool. That's why we build tools. Right, so let's do. Let's take this last piece of IT and use automation. So I want you all to get involved. Um, I expect a pull request from every one of you by the end of the day. <laughs> no, seriously, what would be cool is if your software, your open source project, has ever been used by government, and trust me, it probably has. Think about documenting your controls in YAML and putting them in your repo in the root somewhere so that we can point these sorts of pipelines at them and say, oh, guess what? If you're using Redis or RabbitMQ in your system, here are the security properties of Redis or Rabbit. Here's how they dovetail together. So 
This is the last place, I think, where open source has never actually gotten to be open source. The security, site security plan, I have never seen one, even in the public domain. The reason is the contractors that write them get paid ridiculous amounts of money to write the same 150-page book over and over again for every project. Um, so when we started working on this in August, I guess, July or August, it was the first time anyone had done CC0 licensed IT security for government. So please go and submit patches. I would really ask, keep it CC0. If you make it like attribution, we don't have a mechanism yet to start keeping track of who contributed what. So if it's all like share alike and buy, I'll go crazy and we won't really be able to use it. And I'm already crazy, those of you who know me well. So those are a bunch of repos to go and have a look at. Uh, Conquerors.ci by itself is really cool. Um, I'm putting up some more documentation under the open control label. Uh, so there's a, now a GitHub pages site that just has a diagram of sort of how this fits together. And I do have a concourse pipeline running as soon as I think the security stuff is buttoned down. I'll share that URL as well. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of it. Thank you very much.